Don't you love this Bible verse? Truly, the light is sweet. And it is a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun. That doesn't mean we look at the sun in the middle of a hot sunny day. We have got some common sense there, isn't that true? <laughs> but looking at the early morning sun and the late setting sun can be very beneficial for the eyes and that's an easy time to look at it, isn't it? So what happens when the sun hits the skin? Is the, is the sun important? Yes. When the sun hits the skin, so let's look at the equation. When the sun hits the skin, and by the way, what type of sun? We've got ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A rise. So I'm going to call it UV, that's ultraviolet B rays. When they hit the skin, it's the UVB rays, they convert a form of cholesterol. Did everyone get that? Do you remember what Dr. Malcolm Kendrick said in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con? For the first time, normal levels of a normal vital body substance is being called a disease. Cholesterol. <laughs> it's a very important lipid in the body. So when the UVB rays hit the skin, they can forward, convert a form of cholesterol just under the skin to vitamin D. And vitamin D is essential in the assimilation of calcium. And you can, you can have a lot of calcium, but if you don't have vitamin D, you can't access that calcium. So more, more people suffer from a vitamin D deficiency than a calcium deficiency. Calcium's called the king. And the reason calcium is called the king is because when calcium gets into the body, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of calcium. In fact, in the garden, they called it the trucker of all nutrients. Because when you increase calcium in the garden, all the other minerals jump in the back of the calcium truck, so you increase all your minerals. And I've got some shocking news for you. Bones aren't made of calcium. It's a myth and it's a misconception. What are bones made of? Bones are made of 12 minerals. <coughs> so these 12 minerals are boron yes. and chromium and calcium. Yes, calcium's there, but it's not just calcium. Magnesium, manganese, selenium, silica, Sulfur and potassium and phosphorus and zinc. That's what bones are made of and 64 trace. 64 trace minerals. So students, what do bones need? Do they need calcium supplements? No. No, they don't. No, they don't. And these calcium supplements that so many people take are causing more problems. And you look at the people with osteoporosis taking all these calcium supplements, the osteoporosis is not improving because their bones don't need calcium. What do they need, students? Minerals. So where are we going to get those? Dr. Robert Thompson. I'll put his name up because this is an excellent book to read. Dr. Robert Thompson wrote a book called The Calcium Lie. And Dr. Robert Thompson claims that the clearest indicator of a creator God is seawater. Because seawater has all the minerals in the perfect balance and proportion as is needed for bones. But I've got some good news. We don't have to drink seawater. God wants us to drink pure water. But you can take the salts that contain the minerals. So seawater contains 92 minerals. 
And Celtic salt contains 82. Where are the other 10? Well, they're in such pico proportion in the seawater that when the water's evaporated, it's inevitable that a few are lost. Himalayan salt has 75. So that's still pretty good. So we can get those minerals by taking the salt. Just a little tiny bit before every glass of water. And on your food, what's a baked potato without salt? Our palate tells us, and the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing to be, but to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. How does the salt lose its savour? Well, the largest, largest crystals formed when the water's evaporated are sodium chloride because sodium takes up 30%, chloride takes up 50%. That's scooped up, bleached white, aluminium is put with it so it runs freely. There's your table salt. I'd like to suggest that that's the salt that's lost its savour. Yeah. It's old English. It's lost all of its minerals. The body runs according to precision balance. And so when we take food into our body, we need to take it in the balance, in the proportion, in the way that God designed it to be taken in. So where we get these minerals, number one, the Celtic salt. Number two, dark green leafy vegetables. Now, there's a condition that unfortunately is becoming pop is becoming not popular, certainly not popular, common, <laughs> becoming common today, and that's osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And the doctors say there is no cure, and the drugs that the doctor gives do not cure because this is this statement is found in Spiritual Gifts, uh, Book Three. I'm sorry, I can't give you the page number, but it won't be hard to find. Drugs never cure disease. They're not my words. <laughs> Nature alone is the effective healer. Drugs never cure disease, she says. They just change the form and location of disease. There's all your side effect. Nature alone is the effective healer. And if left to itself, what's that? We haven't put our four-letter word there yet. That's the time. Give it time. If left to itself, how much better could it perform its task? But she says that privilege is seldom granted it. Dark green leafy vegetables are high in these minerals, but they must be organic. Do you remember we talked about the microbes in the soil? And the microbes in the soil make the minerals available for the plant. So if dark green leafy vegetables are grown in demineralized, devitalized soil that's just been pumped up with superphosphate, which creates show ponies of vegetables, might look good, but it does not have any value. And that's the vegetables that the bugs attack. I was in the garden one day and had all these cauliflowers. And a friend of mine said, why aren't, that? like the white moths are there, why, why, why aren't the caterpillars destroying your vegetables? I said, I don't know, actually I do. I put so much into the soil that the plant is so strong it resists the bugs. How incredible is that? That's a very good illustration of the body. When the body's working well you will find that disease will hardly find a place there. Dark green leafy vegetables are very very high in these minerals. But this is a very important point is many people take things that leach the minerals. Do you remember on the first day, I know I'm guilty of information overload, 
On the first day, we looked at things that are leaching minerals. Remember the refined sugar? And do you remember another one? Caffeine? Caffeine. Also, um, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, drugs. And so many people have osteoporosis because of the stimulants they're taking. Yes? Um, Mark, you explained how they leach them. Did you do that the other day? Um, because they're so toxic, the body, the, the body uses the minerals to calm them down mm. so they don't totally kill you. <laughs> so when they leave your body, they're leaving with your minerals. Do you remember what we looked at yesterday that bones need? Progesterone. Progesterone. When we looked at hormones. And remember that progesterone is boosted with the Anna's Wild Yam Cream? Progesterone boosts bone building cells. Those cells are called osteoblast cells, blast of new bone. Osteoblast cells build new bone, osteoclast cells take away old bone. So there should be a balance of the old bone being taken away and the new bone being made. Often in osteoporosis, you've got a lack of osteoblast cells and it can be because of a lack of progesterone. So next week you'll be making a program out for people with osteoporosis, so take note of all this. And the best bone building exercises are exercises that defy gravity. So you're rebounding. And what also the person should be doing is going out into the sunshine to get their vitamin D. So vitamin D is produced just under the skin and it's produced just under the skin with the connection of the UVB rays and cholesterol. Sunscreens stop UVB rays. So a person can have uh, osteoporosis because they're using sunscreen. So what do we do when we go out in the sun? We have a big hat on and we have a long sleeve shirt on. When Michael and I had a holiday in Bali a few years ago, I went down by the pool every day because we were going to go snorkeling in a few days and I wanted to get a tan in a week. So I went down and I laid in the sun and I didn't have sunscreen, I had my clock. And I know that my skin can bear 15 minutes front, 15 minutes back, then under the, under the umbrella. In the afternoon, 15 minutes front, 15 minutes under the umbrella. I thought, oh, it's not coming quick enough. 20. 20 minutes front. And by the time we went snorkeling, both Michael and I had a golden brown town, <coughs> tan. Because when you're snorkeling, you know, you've got the glare from the sun. You're in the sun a lot. You can't get a tan in a day. The darker the skin, the more sun you can bear. So, you know, and the darker the skin, the more sun you need <laughs> to, get the, uh, to get the right vitamin D levels. Now, what I got on my skin was a UVB tan. And a UVB tan is a lasting tan. When you go into uh, shops that that you know have tanning I know in Australia everyone wants to be tanned in Australia so they go to shops and go under these lamps and it's UVBA and the UVBA tan it disappears very very quickly it's the UVB that's the one you want you ever been in the car and the sun's coming through the glass and you and you get burnt that's UVA because the glass blocks the UVB so that's the one that you want. So it takes about two hours for the vitamin D to develop. And if you 
if you have a shower in the morning and cover yourself with soap and go and lay in the sun, you will not get you will not get your vitamin D. Yeah? Is it UVB-A or UVA? It's uh, ultraviolet B or ultraviolet ray A. <coughs> did I say UVBA, did I? Yeah. Sorry. My um, brain runs ahead of my mouth sometimes. No, my, my anyway, something like that. And um, we talked the other day too about when you have a shower, you know, unless you've got mud all over you, there's really no need to soap your whole body up. We had a guy last week that said, I just, I just, sh I just have a shower with water. Yes. With water. If you lay in the sun and then go and have a shower, you, of course you wash it away. But if you lay in the sun and then dive in the sea or dive in a lake, you won't lose your UV. I mean, you won't... You won't lose your vitamin D because uh, you're not washing the oils off. So there are a few things that are necessary to be able to get your vitamin D. And, and your body stores vitamin D quite well. So in the, in the winter months, if you've got a good dose in the summer months, it'll often carry you through. Do you know what they found with... And, I wondered why this was so and I found out when I was in Birmingham three years ago that there were so many cities that were bombed in England in the war they didn't have enough people to um, build them up so they were getting shiploads of people from Jamaica and the West Indy Islands to come over for the building and that's why there's a lot of dark-skinned people in, in England. But they found when the dark-skinned people came to England their, their incidence of heart disease went up 10 times and it's because of lack of vitamin D. So they need to go out and get more sunshine than the white skin. Or someone said, oh, you've got milky skin, the milky skins, <laughs> the dark skin people need. The darker the skin, sometimes very dark skin people need almost 10 times the sun. But they can endure 10 times the sun, yes? Well, I've seen, I've done a lot of uh, analysis of vitamin D and most of the time the people do not have the right uh, vitamin D level and not even over summer, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. so then you'd, have, then you'd have a look at what are their cholesterol levels like, you know, what, what, you know how much are they exposing to, to, uh, to the sun. Because in Australia people have been scared of the sun because they've told that they're going to get skin cancer. Yeah. But I was reading a study done on Norway, and they found, I think it was something like 19, 1980 to, uh, to 2000, skin cancer rate uh, skyrocketed something like 600%. Now that's almost phenomenal. And they found two common denominators. One is the Norwegians are spending more time inside, and when they're outside, they're using sunscreen. So what they're finding now, that lack of vitamin D is a contributing factor to skin cancer. So we need the sun. And again, this is a very important message in Australia. There's a program, it's called Slip Slop Slap. Um, slip, slip a top on, um, slap a hat on and slop the sunscreen on. <laughs> and in schools in Australia, they're putting... Um, covers over the, over the playground so the children aren't even in the sun. And children are not allowed out into the playground unless they've got a hat on. So the vitamin D deficiency is going to get worse and worse and that means bones are not going to be developing the way they should. Yes? I have a patient, she told me her child has to put on a sunscreen in the morning because if the going goes afterwards in kindergarten, that's the requirement. That's right. It is a requirement in the kindergarten. A lady said to me, what do I do? She'd just been to Misty Mountain. She was just mindful of the dangers of sunscreen. And I said, well, this is what you can do. A natural sunscreen is aloe vera. It has a natural sunscreen in it. And you can buy a little tube of aloe vera. I said, well, get a tube of sunscreen squeeze it all out and then suck the aloe vera into it. 
because if you take this, the tube of suns of aloe vera, the you know the often the teacher won't accept it. So you put the and you're not lying because it is a natural sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how she got away with it. But really the best protection is a tan against a lot of sun. So we need sun. This year in Australia we have had so much rain. You might have heard of it. We've had huge floods. Many, many houses have been destroyed. It, it's never been known the floods that Australia has had. In fact, the it had it on the news, you know, they have a helicopter going over and all you're seeing is the roof of the houses. So, and what it happened was you had uh, a high tide and then so much rain. But at Misty Mountain, as the gardener, all my cucumber plants died and we, I have not seen a red tomato all, all, all summer. We're in winter now, mm -hmm. so we have frost, there's no tomatoes now. But... I've never ever known tomatoes not to ripen because we didn't get enough sun. <laughs> so the Bible's right, it is a very pleasant thing for, for us to have sun, for the plants to have sun. Sun's very important. So as you can see by what I've shown you, it's absolutely vital for, for strong bones. Eyes need sun. So when the Bible says... Is it a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun? Science now shows why. Ultraviolet rays from the sun go through neurochemical pathways and hit the pineal gland and help us to sleep better at night. So sun going into the eyes helps us to sleep better. And also when it stimulates the pineal gland, it boosts mood so you're se and it causes a release of serotonin. That's your mood hormone. Don't you feel good in the sun? So what also is happening, and Dr. Neil Nedley found this, and you can read it in his book, Depression A Way Out. He found that 80% of his depressed people, their circadian rhythm was out. And the circadian rhythm basically is the 24-hour rhythm that's in the brain and it's set by light and dark signals. So it's light and dark signals that are fed through the optic nerve to a control centre in the brain where your body clock is located. And your body clock basically is the one that communicates with the, the pineal gland releasing these two. So it resets your circadian rhythm. And what Dr. Neil Nedley found that a lot of depressed people are on technology a lot, watch, watch television, and they don't go to bed late. And the way to reset your circadian rhythm is to allow your eyes to behold the first hour of light in a day. So science is now showing that this is a scientific fact <laughs> and resets your circadian rhythm. So that's a good piece of information to know. So not only does it boost your serotonin, but it resets. It resets the, the circadian, I'll just pull it, circ rhythm. It was probably about 10 minutes, 10, no, not 10 minutes ago, 10 years ago that a group of scientists discovered a receptor site in the eye or on the retina called melanopsin. And melanopsin has to do with uh, brain function. So this is a receptor site on the eye and it's not involved in sight. And what melanopsin does is it absorbs blue light. So again, I don't suggest we look at the sun, but when we're outside and the sun's rays are touching the eye, melanopsin is absorbing the blue light. The highest, sort of, the highest source of blue light is sunlight. And what they found is that when adequate levels of blue light were going into the brain, 
tactical reasoning increase and also the ability to solve mathematical problems increased. So it's a pity that they're putting um, shades over all, the over all the playgrounds in school. Those children need the sun. See, what's happened in Australia, they've gone from one extreme to the other. I remember when I was a teenager, we'd go to the beach and we'd just lie on the beach for hours and we'd come home bright red. <laughs> Dr. Neil Nedley, he states that six to seven sunburns in your lifetime can double your risk of skin cancer. Mm. So you've got to prevent that burn. So when you go to lie in the sun, don't take the sunscreen, take your watch. <laughs> Time yourself, little by little. I know how much my skin can take. You've just got to get to know how much your skin can take. The bluer the eyes, the blonder the hair, the lighter the skin, of course, the more cautious you have to be. And the problem is when you get burnt, you can't go back out into the sun for quite a few days. And this afternoon, we're going to be looking at a herb that can resolve sunburn very quickly, and that's aloe vera. So I think every home should have a pot of aloe vera. It grows very nicely inside. Have yeah? you ever met someone with a bad reaction to aloe vera? No, I haven't. But, you know, I guess there might be, but I haven't met because anyone. I put it on my daughter and, and she was just getting redder and redder with, and more irritated on the skin. Okay, well done. Someone told me that they had an allergy, so I thought maybe she could be She possibly has an allergy, yep. So um, don't put aloe on. <laughs> but there are only four types uh, of aloe vera that are good, and there are a certain number of types that are yes, not having so, that effect. So the barbadensis, the aloe vera barbadensis, is the is the medicinal one. That is the best one. Now one of the problems that's happening today is that people are sleeping with their phones. The current figures are 80% of Americans sleep with their phones. And the pillow is no protection. And if a person can't sleep, what's the first thing they do? Pick up their phone. And what those screens are giving off is blue light. But it is not the same blue light as the sunlight. It is a different frequency. But what happens is, and this is one of the many dangers, is when the eyes look at the screen in the middle of the night, the message to the brain is, wake up, daytime. Because the eyes are used to the blue light coming from the sun. So that's, that's one of the contributing factors as to why insomnia is so common today, is that uh, people are letting their eyes see the screen. Now I know here in Sweden the sun doesn't go down very for very long, does it? <laughs> up in the north. Yeah, it's not up for very long. So really, once the sun goes down, the eye should not be looking at the screens. So after discovering this, I answer all my emails in the day now, <laughs> so that I I haven't got that exposure. <laughs> when I should be sleeping. So that's also an uh, important piece of peop uh, information that you can give to people who are having struggle with, with, uh, with sleep, is that they, they need to not only go to bed early, and we'll look at this in more detail when we look at sleep, not only do they need to go to bed early, and we'll look at why when, uh, when, we look at, when we look at rest, but they also need sunshine in the day. The sunshine resets the body clock, and the sunshine also uh, stimulates a release of melatonin, which is your hormone that helps you sleep better at night. I didn't put that one up, but we'll look at that in more detail when we look at sun, when we look at rest. 
But also the Ecclesiastes says the sleep of a labouring man is sweet. <laughs> so we're so that so we'll also have a look at that. But most people don't realise that sun in the day will help you sleep better at night. Now where I discovered this was uh, when I went from Australia to 15 hour flight to um, to Dallas and I went straight to the health retreat that I was working at and I slept that night and usually do sleep the first night but the following night I couldn't get to sleep till 2 a.m. and that is very difficult especially when they had 24 guests and I had to consult them all that next day and as I'm sitting in the consultation room very hard to stay awake and I know the worst thing you can do is sleep the sun was shining in the glass doors behind me so I opened the glass door sat in the sun and just closed my eyes for a minute waiting for the next guest and that night I slept so the first night I slept, the second night I couldn't sleep till 2 a.m. And the next night I said, I slept. And that's when I realized it reset my circadian rhythm. There's a book called Better Eyesight Without Glasses by Dr. William Bates. This was written in about the 50s. He almost lost his uh, ticket as an eye doctor over writing this book. It's called Better Eyesight Without Glasses. And he believes that you cannot overdo the sun. And in the last chapter of his book, Better Eyesight Without Glasses, he goes through the eight laws of health and shows that eyes need fresh air. Eyes need sunshine. Eyes need you to stop all the stimulants. Eyes need you to go to sleep at night. Eyes need exercise because you increase the circulation of the blood to the eyes. Eyes need nutrition. Eyes need to be well hydrated. Eyes need for you to assess your stress levels. And when you love God and when you learn to thank him for everything and know that he's the solution God and he will not put you anything through anything that you can't cope with, then your stress levels will be a lot less. But he says that we should say most people find after being in a dark room and going out into the sun, it's, it's a little hard to be in the sun. So he says you go outside, you close your eyes and you put your, your face straight towards the sun. And he said the sun's rays will go through your skin to your eyes and get your eyes ready for sun. Now you only have to do it for um, 30 seconds. So maybe you'll do it in the break. So put your head right up, look at the sun with your eyes closed and then put your head down, open your eyes and you'll find you're, you're used to the sun. It's not a wise thing to wear sunglasses. And the reason is that when we go out into the sun the rays of the sun are going through our eyes to our brain and our brain is assessing the strength of the sun. And if it's very, very strong, it'll cause little receptor sites on the skin to close up, which can prevent you burning really badly. But when you have sunglasses on and you go out, then the brain's not getting the message, so a person can burn more easily if they've got sunglasses on. I don't wear sunglasses. I think if I was driving in the city all day and the glare from the buildings and the other cars, I might. And if I was snow skiing and the ski was white and the sky was blue and the sun was strong, I, I might wear sunglasses because I know the glare. The glare can be difficult. But as a rule, I, I do not wear sunglasses. So that's another important tip, yeah? Yeah, I have a question because... I suffer from uh, what they call lazy eye, one mm -hmm. of my eyes. That's why I have the kind of glasses I have. As soon as I get out, they get dark. And as soon as I come in, they, they, they become normal glasses. And we are two in my family who kind Well, of it might be an idea for you to get Dr. William Bates' book because he assesses many eye issues mm -hmm. and uh, shows how you can, you can strengthen your eyes. Yeah. 
One way to strengthen your eyes is on the rebounder. And this is what I do. On the rebounder, I focus on one thing as I'm jumping and every 10 jumps, I focus long and I focus far and I focus long and then I focus far. You can do eye exercises to strengthen, to strengthen your eyes. Thus the title of his book, Better Eyesight Without Glasses. And yet what you will find is that a lot of people are told to keep your eyes, don't go out in the sun. If you do wear glasses uh, for sight, my suggestion is you go outside every day for a short period of time without your glasses on. Because as you can see, I've just told you several reasons why we need to go without them so that the so that the sun goes through the eyes because your brain needs sun and your brain gets sun through your eyes and this you know it's a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun for the brain <laughs> because your your eyes are an extension of your brain and dr william bates he shows that eye strain when you're fresh from uh, Sleeping all night and exercise, eye strain then can strengthen your eyes. But eye strain at night, when you're tired and you're ready to sleep, that weakens the eyes. So how many people go home at night and do computer work? That's very common, isn't it? So really, any computer work, iPad work, phone work, that really should be done in the morning. It's easy for me at the moment because Australia's awake in the morning. Let's see, what's the time? Australia's just about to go to sleep now. So I have my dialogue early in the morning with my Australian family. So remember the sun. Remember that the light is sweet and it is a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun. So I'd like to open the floor now for questions. If anybody has questions, we can spend a little bit of time on questions, yes? I have a specific question, but it's for sure interesting for the other people too. I have a patient, she has osteoporosis, and we were talking about it, and I was trying to explain how the lifestyle, what we shall do, and she said she implemented it, and now she came again, and she had like a, a, the bones were sintering, three of them. They were... How do you say? Well, Disintegr disintegrating. Disintegrating. Yes, mm -hmm. did. Well, I tried not to give all the. I think I even gave the progesterone a cream. Any other ideas? Oh, well, the other I thing is, it does need time. And the other thing is, you're looking at the age of the person and you're looking at how long they have been uh, doing things that will cause the, the bones to deteriorate. Well, she's, she's, <coughs> like, there's no. Uh, no thing that you say you're an this, but she says that she really does implement the things. Mm, yeah. So sometimes when, it's like the lady that said to me one day with high blood pressure, I went through everything, yes, yes, yes. And I just had an impression to go back to exercise. So then I said, what type of exercise do you do? Oh, I'm busy all day. <laughs> you see, that's, that's, not, that's not enough. So then I had to show her that uh, you, you've got to <laughs> implement an exercise program. So uh, some people think that they're eating well, they think that they're sleeping well, but, but they're actually not. So sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper. So if the progesterone cream, it should get better again? Yes. Again, the recovery depends on how chronic the situation is. And I often say this, and it's a very good thing to say. It depends on how much damage has been done already, how chronic the situation is, how old the person is, and how diligent the person is to implement what you've got to do to get a turnaround. So what I say to people is, even if your osteoporosis hasn't deteriorated anymore, that's a very good sign. Mm -hmm. And remember, we've been, we've been um, brought up, all of us have been brought up with You've got a problem, you go to the doctor, you have a drug, and you're cured. And that's why I often have to talk to people about giving it time. So sometimes I give the illustration is, like a plant grows, like a baby grows. I just got a photo of my little grandson this morning, he's one. 
If I look at him, the whole time I'm with him, I can't see him growing. <laughs> but if I look at him a month later, you know, there's a change. So, and it's also our disappointments are always equal to our expectations. So that's why I'm always cautious when I advise people on what the results may be. So that's what I say, even if the tumour hasn't grown, even if the test says you haven't deteriorated, that's a good sign. But if the person expects to go back and the tumour's gone, now they're going to be really disappointed. Can you see that? And the disappointment often has an effect on people to just stop doing what they're doing. Yeah? But it got worse in a year. Yeah, so that's what I'd look at is the age. And I'd... It's around 70. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. But what I do know is the doctor's drug doesn't improve it. Because I've had, I've had people on that and they've just said, you know, it's... And of course, uh, Fozimax, we call it in Australia, that's usually... Yes. I mean, it, yeah, it, it has side effects. So that's what I'd look at. What sort of exercise is she doing? She you know. has a garden. I mean, she, I don't know whether she's doing a rebound. Yeah, yeah. Because you can do a little bit of weight on the rebound too. And all depends on where it's deteriorating. Sometimes if there's been a past injury to that area, that, that there can be deterioration there. And it's like the lady last week, she got headaches. I said, did anything ever happen? And she said, oh, I fell out of the apple tree when I was 10. <laughs> and so, you know, that's an indication. And then after three days, she said, oh, and I fell out of the tractor when I was three. So, you know, sometimes people don't remember straight away some of the things that have happened to them. Yes? I take extra boron. Extra boron? Uh, boron for, okay. for the... Osteoporosis. Okay. Well, someone told me that it was good. I'm not. Uh, I, I know that it's a. I know in Australia we have borax, and you can clean the bathroom with borax, and there's nothing wrong with that because it is a naturally occurring mineral, and yeah. some people are lacking boron. Because of, yeah. But I, maybe that was the missing link. Because yeah. I had uh, as wild cream for a year, mm. and may, maybe you're missing the boron, so I got a little. Yeah. So yeah, that that may help. I don't. I don't know, I don't know that one. No. I, I, I try and see what. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You haven't said very much about supplements. Um, mm, yeah. yeah. I've heard. I don't know if you know Michael Berger. He talks a lot about how supplements cause many other problems because they're refined and taken up in the wrong way by the body. Yes, that, that is true. There are supplements and there are supplements. Uh, at Misty Mountain, we don't hardly use any supplements because this is true. In fact, I was uh, reading a report from one health writer and he, he said that he went to the pharmaceutical factory and one, one section was doing all the drugs and the other section was doing all the vitamins. You know, <laughs> They're made by the pharmaceutical company. Your body cannot access it. That is true. But there are some supplements that are taken from, from our vegetables, from natural sources. And I also mm -hmm. find that if, uh, you know, there are some, some people, especially when the hormones are, are badly out of balance, we use a liquid uh, B vitamin, a methylated B vitamin that that certainly can be accessed by the body. So we don't use many supplements, but there are times when they may be necessary. The other supplement we use a bit is magnesium. And basically that's a mineral. Yes, yeah. Yeah? What about glaucoma? <coughs> glaucoma, yeah. The, the glaucoma, uh, the pressure in the eyes. Mm -hmm. So I told you the story of my husband and I also mm -hmm. told you the story of that poor lady that had the, the drill put into her eye. See, my husband, you know, they told him he had pressure in his eyes, but he, he has no symptoms. And sometimes people are told something and because they think it's happening, they'll, you know, they'll worry about it and feel they have to do something. But I believe the body tells you. So what can you do about glaucoma? 
the castor oil on the eye. We talked about that yesterday. Some people have found washing the eye with lemon juice helps. That sounds a little stingy, but it doesn't sound near as stingy as cayenne pepper. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But if you do the cayenne pepper, and I'm going to be talking about a little bit this afternoon when we're talking about some herbs, um, some of the herbs that you can use for eyes. Uh, the, if you do the cane pepper, it has to be very, very small dose and just what you can handle. But one man said to me that I, the eye drops from the doctor sting. So what's the difference? <laughs> so he was going Well, what you do is you pour boiling water on cane pepper and then you strain it through a little cloth and then you uh, wash it with the eye. No, you don't put cane pepper in the eye. No. It won't hurt the eye, but you'll suffer. <laughs> and the lemon juice you would use every day? Uh, I have never done it and I've never advised it, but I have uh, spoken to people that have said that it has helped. I, I'm actually not sure how they do it. Mm. But there is a tea that we'll be looking at this afternoon that can help, but I'll... I hesitate to go into it now because I want to show you what the herbs are, how they work. So we'll touch on that this afternoon. Yeah? I'm, I'm thinking on vitamin D in Scandinavia because many people say we have to take some. Yeah, yeah. Because of the sun is like this in winter. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, so I look back at traditionally. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, 100 years ago, people didn't. People didn't have the deficiencies. But I think the reason why people have deficiencies today is we're exposed to so many chemicals. And it is true, people are not outside as much as they used to be. Even in the very cold countries, they still went outside. They just rugged up. My brother-in-law says there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. <laughs> and I think today there certainly is a place for vitamin D supplements when someone's very low. During yeah. the winter months, it said that you cannot absorb vitamin D from the sun during the winter period, the, the, the middle of the winter. So they say you can't absorb? The, some mm -hmm. studies or something, I don't remember. Well, you won't absorb as much because there's not as much, but I, I doubt if you wouldn't absorb any. So did you, sorry. Did you already see someone who was healed from osteoporosis through just taking synthetic soil, dark green leafy things and what you said? What we see is that it's managed. Okay. Do you remember what I said the other day? I really keep away from that word cure okay. or totally healed. Because sometimes it's not possible that it can be because of everything the person's done for the last 60 years. And often osteoporosis <coughs> and arthritis will manifest themselves where there's been previous damage, mm -hmm. you know, a past fall. We had a guy come and do our program and he came in on a walking stick. He could hardly walk. He was only in his 50s. Mm -hmm. He had two total knee replacements, two hip replacements. He was a famous footballer when he was young. So much injury, so much damage. And what often happens is they want to play. I know in Australia, it's almost like every young man wants to be a football player. So they finally get into the game and then, you know, they're tackled and they hurt themselves. All they want to do is get back on the field. So they take a painkiller that, you know, maybe cortisone on so they can go back on the field. And so now the natural voice that tells them to stop and rest so that the body can heal, they don't listen. They can't hear it because of the painkillers. And, and, and this man was a result of that. Do you know that they will just do anything to get back out on that field. And so they take the drugs, they take, you know. <laughs> but it, it, it has a cost has a great cost. That's why the history is so important. So my first thing when someone has a problem in one area, have you ever had an injury there? And often, often they say no, but then a few days later they came back and they said, look, I'd forgotten that when I was a little girl, I 
I fell over there. Yes? I just want to say in relation to what she said about the vitamins, because in Sweden we don't, but I remember maybe 15 years ago, there was a, an article in the, in the newspaper that it was recommended rather in that article that it's always good to go out, even when we don't see the mm -hmm. sun, there is, there is... Well, you are still getting vitamin D on a cloudy day. Mm -hmm. yeah. The sun's rays still come through. Uh, eating the Celtic salt, is it not enough to have it on the food? And you're talking about taking it with water? Uh, no. No, it's not enough to have it on the food. And when we talk about water, I'll go right into the cell and show you how it pulls the water into the cell. Dr. Um, Robert Thompson, in his book, The Calcium Lie, he said, when you take a crystal of Celtic salt before every glass of water, he said, all you're doing is replacing the minerals you lost yesterday. We, we lose them uh, in our perspiration. We lose them in our urine. We, we lose them in our colon. And if you're working out and perspiring a little bit, you're, you're losing a little bit more. So do you mean to say that we absorb it faster with the water than with the food? Here is the cell. Here is the membrane around the cell. And when you take the crystal of Celtic salt on your tongue, there are three magnesiums and the magnesiums are absorbed by the mucous membranes in the mouth. And so they, the blood takes it straight to the cell wall. You have your glass of water and the water pulls it inside the cell. So many people are drinking lots of water but they're dehydrated because the water is not getting inside the cell. That's the quickest way to hydrate a body. Remember, there's the CBD. So when someone says, I'm drinking lots of water, but I don't want to drink more because my feet swell. I'm just in the bathroom all day. That tells me the water's not getting in the cell. And in Australia, there are the ancestors of the, ah, maybe ancestors, not the word, the, uh, say myself, say my, I know my father-in-law was a um, soldier in, um, in Papua New Guinea, and he was a prisoner of war for five years on the Kokoda Trail. You've heard of the Kokoda Trail? So many people whose grandparents died, and not many did on the Kokoda Trail. The Japanese made them build this mm -hmm. railway there. So a lot of Australians go and walk the Kokoda Trail, you know, out of memory of their, of their ancestors. And we've had a few deaths on the Kokoda Trail. And they're drinking five litres of water a day and they're dying of dehydration. Because they're, it's hot in Papua New Guinea and they're perspiring huge amounts. What they need is the salt. <laughs> because the magnesium would pull the water inside the cell. So you can drink too much water if you're not having the salt. Yes? I'm all day out and I'm, for me it's hard to have even this bottle with me. Yeah. Can I put in the salt in the water? If you put the, the salt in the water, you're now drinking salt water okay. and where to, where to drink pure water. And because magnesium is a water hungry molecule, that's why it pulls the water inside the cell. So if you put it in the water, it'll just dissolve in the water. You won't get this same effect. So I have a tiny little container that I have in my pocket or in my little bag, so it makes it easy. But how did they do that before? Why wasn't it a problem in ages before? Because food before had so many more minerals. Mm -hmm. Lots more minerals. Yeah. Our, a lot of our food's mineral deficient today. Now, what I just shared with you here, and I'll, I'll do it again in a little bit more detail when we look at water. I didn't get that from Dr. Robert Thompson. I got it at another health seminar that I was at. So when I read it in Dr. Robert Thompson, you know, the multitude of counsellors, their safety, I thought, wow, this has been, been discovered in...
quite a few areas. Yes? What about sun lamps? Are there any safe ones? Uh... Uh, you'd have to look. There, possi there possibly are. And I know that, that they... I know I was at a retreat not long ago and uh, they were putting the the UV lamps on a lady's who had a had a problem in her back and and warmed up the area and then massaged but I haven't looked really in detail at those mm. we've exhausted the questions <laughs> one more yeah uh, is there any connection uh, with skin cancer and uh, what we eat Yes, there's a lot. There's a lot. You see, skin cancer has only really risen, I'd say, in the last 100 years. And in the last 100 years, our food doesn't have the nutrients that it used to have. There are a few other things, and that is uh, margarine. Margarine is a toxic fat, and I'll show you why it's a toxic fat when we look at fats. And because it's a toxic fat and the body doesn't recognise it, it tries to get rid of it very quickly and often it'll come out through the skin. Cancer rates have certainly risen since margarine was, was used and skin cancer has risen since margarine was used. That is true. Is that because the toxins are stored in the fat then? The skin, uh, basically it's just being thrown out. Yeah. It's being thrown out because remember your skin is an organ of elimination. We were talking about hydrotherapy at the discussion here, and we were going to ask um, because I've I've understood that when you are sleeping, you should be a little bit colder or cooler in your body temperature. It shouldn't be uh, the same as during the day, and and I've experienced it once myself that I found it difficult to sleep after doing hot and finishing with cold. And going to sleep for the night. Though. That's a very good question. I never finish my hot shower at night with cold. <laughs> because I don't want to wake up. <laughs> I just want to have a hot shower that's going to relax me and into bed. But if I have a hot shower in the morning, I always finish with cold. In addition, at Wildwood, when we were there in the hydrotherapy um, rooms there, they, they would always do hot and finish with cold and rest but it was always only like 20 minutes. Yeah. So yeah. it still has that benefit. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're going to be going outside or exposed to air, you must finish with that cold. But when I have a hot shower at night, I just have a hot shower, and in a few minutes I'm in bed. I think the body tells us when we're too hot or too cold at night, and this is why I really like sleeping with cotton or wool or feathers because that helps you to regulate your, your, your sleep a little better. A little while ago I was sleeping in one area and it was a really thick polyester quilt. Oh dear, I, I found it very hard to get used to that. I found that I'd wake up in the, and my, my night dress was wet from perspiration. It was very hard to balance my temperature with this, with this polyester quilt. So at our retreat, and we'll be touching on this later, we, uh, well, I usually buy the linen and I've always got my eye out for specials. <laughs> and especially in bedding, in cotton blankets, in cotton quilts, in uh, feather quilts, wool quilts. We've got one quilt we use, and it's, uh, it's not all wool, but it's part wool, part polyester. And they're still quite good. And it has a cotton cover.